And that is massive amounts of money printing. Yeah. It's coming. So I don't know what's going to happen in the next six months. I feel pretty certain of what's going to happen in the next three to five years. All right. So Mark Moss is a good friend of mine. Um, he's an amazing guy. If you don't know Mark, he is all over YouTube. He's got about 500,000 subscribers, talks about economics and Bitcoin and all kinds of things. Uh, my name is Bronson Hill. I'm the CEO of Bronson Equity. We've got a 200 million in multifamily assets as well as alternative stuff such as ATMs and car washes and oil and gas. Love to connect with you. But in this interview, I was able to interview Mark Moss and it was in a panel with Jason Hartman and Jay Martin. Just a couple other stellar guys. You'll see the notes or actually the link to this video, the entire video down below. You can check it out. But in this video, we talked to Mark about really what's happening right now in economics. Every time I get a chance to, to talk to Mark, I always learn something about economics. And we asked him really, what is the best investment right now? What, what's happening in the economic world? And what should I be doing with my investments? You know, uh, what Jay said is just the most important thing. He said that I think three times, and I'm going to say it again, time frame. Whenever you listen to anybody, no matter who it is or what they're trying to say, always ask yourself over what time frame. You're going to hear one guy is going to say bonds are the worst investment. Another guy is going to say bonds are the best investment. Over what time frame? Most likely they'll probably agree. They're just thinking of different time frames in their head. And so I think that's the most important thing. Um, everybody should always understand time frame before they buy anything. And whether that be my time frame is to flip this stock today as a day trader, or I'm going to hold it for 10 years and let it develop, we should always understand what we're buying, why we're buying it, and how long what we're expecting from that. So I think that's super important. And the other thing I'd say about time frame, and I, I know Jay was saying it, I think specifically in regards to what the Fed may do, you know, um, what the market is telling us what the Fed will do is they're pricing in two rate cuts this year. Um, historically, that is very bad for the markets. Typically when the Fed cuts, it's because the markets are already turning sour to kind of the point Jay made uh, with the podcast guest he was talking about. Um, sure, there's a case for $1,200 gold, I guess, if they think the economy gets that bad and markets crash that bad, that's not my base case. Um, in that type of environment, would be what may be interesting is uh, gold's, at, at the end of the day, I think Jay touched on it. At the end of the day, we don't really want money None of us actually want money. What we want is the things that money buys us. Um, so we're basically bartering, right? And money is a way we can store our wealth until such a time we're ready to deploy it into those things that we want. Um, so then at that point, it really comes down to purchasing power. And it's and it's totally possible that gold could drop to $1,200 and still buy more goods and services than it does at 2000 And so you have to kind of think about it that way. Um, but Again, uh, to to uh, to uh, continue to 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 applaud Jay for what he was saying, I think the other thing is like um, the, it. Yes, we should always have the time horizon that we're thinking of, but ultimately it should be a long time horizon. Nothing good happens in a short period of time. Okay, so this came up in this interview a bunch about the investment timeline. What is your investment timeline? It's got to be correct. A lot of people have too short of a timeline. They're not thinking long term enough. They're thinking this quarter. They're thinking this year. Whereas if you're just simply right and you're willing to wait, you're going to be in good shape. There's a lot of importance. We've talked about doing your own research, putting in the work, reading reports. I know Mark does a lot of this. So, you know, I encourage you to do that as well. He's going to get in a little bit about real estate, that some areas are doing poorly, some are doing well. We love areas where we see population growth, job growth, income growth. We're buying a lot in the Jacksonville, Florida market. We've got about 1,500 units there where rents are actually still rising at the time of this video. So check it out. All growth, whether it be uh, body development, personal growth, whether it's you know personal discipline, whether it's building businesses or investments, it always happens over a long period of time. So nothing good happens in a short period of time. We know who the best investors in the world are, you know Warren Buffett, Ray Dalio, et cetera. We don't know who the best day traders are. There's never been one. Uh, and so we want to think over a long-term time horizon. And if, I think if you look at it that way, and we can dig into this more, I'm sure you probably have questions about it. But if you dig into the fundamentals of the U.S. economy, the global economy, you look at what the central banks, the Fed and the central banks are doing, the shape that the banks are in, the shape that the U.S. government, the Treasury is in. If you look at that, if you look at the reports that the CBO puts out, um, as uncertain as the world seems at this point right now with the rise of China and Taiwan and Ukraine, as uncertain as all that is, to me, there's one thing that's almost as certain as death and taxes, not quite as certain, and that is massive amounts of money printing. Yeah. It's coming. So I don't know what's going to happen in the next six months. I feel pretty certain of what's going to happen in the next three to five years. 
let me add a little nuance to what Jason said there, because uh, he kind of said two things. And a lot of times people listening maybe don't pick up on the nuance of that. And so uh, he said commercial real estate, CBMS market is is set for a, uh, there's a big problem. There. There's a big bomb that could, that could blow up there. Uh, he's right. Um, he said commercial real estate isn't doing that good. I think he said specifically multifamily. Uh, but then he said there's no such thing as the real estate market. So um, don't take that as a blanket statement. Um, so, so there's nuance to that. So one, yeah. um, some multifamily markets are doing poorly and some multifamily markets are still doing very good. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, the other thing I'd say is then you have to separate commercial real estate. Obviously, yes, the, the commercial uh, real estate market, the, the mortgages are really bad. There's about $3 trillion of those sitting on small regional banks balances. One in five office buildings are not paying rent right now. We have a hundred billion of that has to be refinanced in the next 12 months at these new high rates. That's all types of trouble for the banking system. Yeah. Now that could blow up the banking sector and we could continue to see that default. My base case is most likely the Fed starts buying and starts doing some new three, four letter agency and they start taking yeah. over those bonds, just like they were taking over long dated treasuries. They'll probably start taking those bonds and they'll probably solve that. That'd be my base case. But there's certainly weakness there. There's not as many loans being generated there. And particularly when you separate the commercial real estate from the multifamily versus the uh, office space, yeah. uh, certainly office space in San Francisco and Seattle is getting absolutely crushed, whereas office space in Jacksonville is still probably doing pretty good. And yeah. so just understand there's nuance to that uh, in the multifamily or I'm sorry, in commercial between, you know, office space versus multifamily and then even in those areas as well. Um, and yeah. even though, like I said, the, the debt bomb is about to explode, it's probably going to be papered over too. Let me, let me answer that question for Jason. Yeah, interesting. Uh, okay. For everybody listening and for Jason, just, just go look up Triffin's Dilemma. All right. That's what you want to figure out. That's, that explains uh, the problem with being the world reserve currency. So uh, basically to summarize it is basically what it means is that because the U.S. is the reserve currency or whoever is per the dilemma, um, that nation will now have to offshore its entire manufacturing base because as the role of the primary reserve currency of the world, they'll have to be responsible to send out dollars to the world. So that's why the United States had to offshore its entire manufacturing base. So we had to get rid of everything so we could import products. When we import products, we export currency. Right. That's the and problem. We also export inflation. Yeah. That's the problem yeah. with Triffin's Dilemma. Right. That's why no other nation wants to be the reserve currency. China doesn't want to be the reserve currency. No other nation wants that. China doesn't want to hollow out its manufacturing base. Now, when you say, is it good or bad? Well, it's good for lots of reasons. It's also bad for lots of reasons. So it's, it's bad because it's hollowed out the entire middle class of the United States. It's hollowed out our entire industrial um, complex. It's, yeah. it's, it's hollowed out our ability to, to you know, manufacture the basic necessary uh, goods that we need here. It's good and it's bad for all those jobs that have been left. It's bad, right? So there's a bunch of reasons why it's bad. It's good because Americans um, and you know our neighbors in the North like Jay, uh, Americans have benefited from that because we have very low cost of goods because to your point, Jason, we offshore all that inflation. So if we lived in these other nations, we'd be dealing with massive amounts of inflation. So it's good for Americans if you haven't lost your job. It's good for some of us because it keeps our purchasing power low, um, but it's made us, yeah. uh, our purchasing power- Right. Hi. Right. You're right. Inflation. Uh, oh, I get it. But, yeah. <laughs> but, it, but it's, but it's hurt the United States strategically because now we don't have any ability to manufacture even our most basic and most critical goods. You know, yeah. And so, so that would be one reason why in the long run, it would be good for the United States in a lot of reasons. It would be good for the United States to give up its role as the reserve currency of the world. However, the United States wouldn't be able to continue to run trillion dollar deficits. So right, then yeah. the U.S. has to start to live within its means. So, so there's good and bad, and you kind of have to balance that nuance out. So Triffin's dilemma, right? No one wants to be the reserve currency. He's going to get into kind of what that means, but there are pluses and minuses to being the reserve currency. Pluses are, you know, you can buy stuff super cheaply. You know, the, the currency itself becomes a value that everybody wants to have, but the challenge is it hollows out the manufacturing. So he gets into kind of what the problem is and why no one really wants to be the reserve. No one else wants to be the reserve currency, not China, not, you know, uh, the Euro. No one else wants to be that. 
Yeah, I think it was a combination of both. So the U.S. took over the reserve currency of the world in 1944 under the Bretton Woods Agreement. Um, it did go to a, a strictly fiat currency, meaning there was nothing backing the currency in 1971. However, from 1944 to 1971, the U.S. was printing way too many paper certificates, which is why the eventual peg was broken because all the nations were saying, hey, we don't want this paper. We want our gold. Right. Uh, France sent its warship over to collect its gold in 1971. And Richard Nixon said, nope. Basically, we bank we're bankrupt. We default on our debt, right? So it was already this fiat currency, meaning they were already printing more than there was backing it, and then it officially became declared at that point. Um, as far as you know, did we start offshoring because we had to send more dollars to the world? I think it was both. Um, you know, uh, I think to think that President Richard Nixon or President Biden, for that matter, have any really control over things is probably a little naive. Uh, the strings are being pulled, pulled, the game's being played at a much higher level. Uh, so there's been a globalist agenda for a long time. And, you know, you look at like McKinsey, which is like the largest consulting company in the U.S., is really probably the one that pushed all that manufacturing overseas. So it certainly helped offset the inflation, yeah. right? Because as prices were going up, we got lower cost of goods, to your point, I think you're making. Yeah. Um, but it was also because we have to supply the, the dollars to the world. And if you look back to like the 2008 you know, I know you, you know, you and George and I, I've th talked a lot about this with like Jeff Snyder and Jeff Snyder talks about this Euro dollar market. So the Euro dollar market, maybe you've heard about this from Jeff Snyder or George Gammon, as he mentioned that there's these European banks that are creating uh, basically dollars by just simply creating loans in denominated in dollars. And so it creates additional dollars and additional risk to the financial system. He's going to jump into that a little bit more here. And the euro dollar market is the amount of dollars that exist outside of the U.S. in the in the world, and how when that fell in 2008, when we got a shortage in those dollars, that's when the real depression really set in. And so back to Triffin's dilemma, we have to continually expand and, and give those dollars to the world. So I think that there's probably some combination in there, Jason. I'll jump in first because I want to make one more point, and and back to the question that you asked Jay originally, not to dominate this conversation, but I think it's important for everyone listening. Um, Jay said that he didn't think it was that big of a deal. I would say it's a really big deal and it's not a big deal. It's both. So what do I mean by that? Uh, when we saw back to Jason's point, when the dollar took over the reserve currency from the pound sterling, it's about a 30 year process. Okay. So um, it's a big deal if the US doesn't have it, especially for Americans, it's a big deal for the rest of the world, maybe not so, not so much. Um, so it's a big deal because we're on that path, as Jay said, right? This is a process. Um, so it's a big deal because this is the path that we're going down and we know where we're going to be in 20 years from now. It's not a big deal as in it doesn't really mean a lot to us today. We're kind of like the frog in the boiling pot, so to speak. Right. The other thing I just want to say for everybody listening, because it's kind of important to understand this nuance, there's there's two different things at play here. There's the reserve currency, and then there's the reserve asset. So the reserve currency is what people use for transactions. And so what we're seeing with all this rise of the BRICS and they're trading oil in yuan and blah, 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 um, that's the currency. So they're deciding to pay in other currencies. The reserve asset is where do they save their money? If you're a if you're a sovereign nation or sovereign wealth fund, you got hundreds of billions of dollars. Where do you keep that? And so that's being kept in U.S. bonds. That's in U.S. treasuries. So certainly the currency side, the U.S. dollar is going down in the currency transactions. We've seen the yuan go from a market share of two percent of global transactions a year ago to four point five percent now. So it's almost doubled in, in a year. The euro is about 6% of global trade. So it's almost on par with the euro now. But 6%, the dollar is 86%. So though the currency the currency has taken a bite out of it, the, the global reserve asset being U.S. Treasuries isn't really going anywhere. Now, we can see that the U.S. Treasury of foreign buying is going down while gold is going up. So the trend is that people are going to more gold. Um, but there's no other reserve asset besides going to gold. Um, I'm a Bitcoin guy. I don't see it going to Bitcoin anytime soon. Well, hey, um, Mark, Mark, I must I must point out, though, on one of your videos, you did talk about Chuck E. Cheese coins. Yeah, Chuck E. Cheese coins, asset. maybe. Maybe. <laughs> a lot of those to store but, some value. <laughs> but it's, under, it's important to understand that because there's no other country that has a functioning um, financial system to become the next reserve asset. Uh, China doesn't have an open market. China doesn't have a functioning bond market like the US does. Neither does Russia. Neither do any of the BRICS. So there is no replacement right now. 
And it would take, I mean, it could take a minimum of even 10 years to even try to get some sort of a functioning treasury market up. And then who knows about the trust and all that. So we're really nowhere close to being a reserve asset being replaced. We're going to, I think the trend will continue to see US treasuries trending down, gold will trend up. Um, so anyway, just some context into that. Yeah, that's great. Um, that. I'll, I'll answer your question now, since I guess I'm already talking. Um, so what do I see as being the biggest risk? I say, I think, I think the biggest risk over the longer term, if I want to say five or 10 years, let's say, let's say this decade, I think the bigger risk is um, not being long enough. Not being long enough. The so timeline mo- issue, not not being having a long enough time horizon. Basically. No, no, not, not uh, being invested for enough growth. So what's going to happen is everybody's worried about losing money and everyone's trying to protect their downside. Uh, But I think the dip is going to be so fast um, and it will cause so much inflation. Most people won't be long enough, meaning they'll be sure they'll be in the S&P 500. They'll be indexed to the S&P 500. They'll own some basic real estate in their area but that may not keep up with inflation. So in Zimbabwe, it used to be pegged one-to-one with the dollar. Uh, Everybody became a billionaire in Zimbabwe, but it was 300 billion for an egg. So how do we get long enough? So we need to figure out how we can use leverage. I got a yeah, Jason, Jason's got one of those. I have so one you, of those on the back shelf here too somewhere. So, so <laughs> you know, in regards to real estate, I like real estate, especially if it's, if it's trophy real estate. I think your middle house in Kansas or Missouri isn't going to cut it. Beachfront, Miami, or you know, Southern California probably will. So trophy properties, specifically ones that you can use leverage on. Right. Obviously, that's what I like about real estate. You get the loans, which is the leverage. I think other assets like Bitcoin, of course, I think will do do well as as well. I think some of the energy sector, but you know, the S and P five hundred, your average, you know, mutual funds, et cetera, they're not going to keep up with inflation. And so, while everybody's waiting for the Fed to push asset prices back up, careful what you wish for, they're going to get it. But I think inflation is going to outpace everybody. So that's my that's my biggest risk. I think. So have you used ChatGPT, which is known as kind of a general AI? There's also narrow AI. I think this AI conversation is super interesting. And if you were paying attention, you watch ChatGPT just kind of take over everything. We use it for a lot of our marketing. We use it for topics, for video ideas, all kinds of things. Uh, maybe stick in the comments below how you feel AI is going to be changing our lives. You know, I've studied this uh, for a, quite a while because I've been scared about it and I've been trying to pay attention to it. I had the... Uh, I had the uh, I don't know. I was lucky enough to be able to sit down with Naval. If you guys yep. know who Naval is, yeah. a, wow. well, a legendary That's VC great. investor. Yeah. I got to sit down with him a few months ago at uh, Michael Saylor's house. And I sat down with him and I took the opportunity to pick his brain. And I said, Naval, I know you're in Silicon Valley. I know you've been in AI for a long time. I know you've been investing in this space. Can you, can you break it down for me? And so we talked about it for quite at length. And, and basically what I've uncovered in my own research and talking with him is there's two main types of AI. There's general AI and there's narrow AI. So narrow AI is when you can train AI to do one specific task, like drive a car or play chess or play a video game, something like that, do a a language model, something like that. And we've had massive, massive, massive growth and progress in the narrow AI. The general AI, where it could become a sentient and all those things, where we have this Terminator world where we get smarter than humans and (laughs) things that we determine him, he said has advanced since the 70s. He said, we've had made almost no progress into that. He said that we can't even we've had the Terminator out- movies, though. The Terminator movies were since the 70s. So, yeah, uh, but in, <laughs> in the, the actual, in the actual <laughs> yeah, tech, exactly. you know, so, um, you know, he said that, uh, you know, the one cell of a human brain is so complex that they can't even get close to even getting the power of that. Yeah. So I think, you know, based off of the research I've done talking to him and, and stuff, I think that, uh, I'm not so afraid of that. I think it's a, maybe a little bit overblown. I think maybe to Jay's point, trying to uh, maybe slow people down, there might be some alternative means. Typically, laws and regulations are being pushed by the lobbyists, which have some sort of like a vested and interest the in that. Yeah. Uh, and, and the competitors. But uh, to, to Jay's point, and I think to your question, Bronson, uh, I would absolutely agree. Or I think Jay actually kind of made the point, like government versus entrepreneurs. And um, I did actually just finished recording a video before I came on talking about how our existing form of government we have today is not compatible with the age that we're in. Yeah. And so when you look back through the history of, of the world, thousands of years, you see the forms of government we have has always changed. And technology is what always changes that. And uh, about 250 years ago, we got a new form of technology and it was the industrial revolution. And it brought people from the farms and the, and the, and the cottage industry into the cities and it centralized everybody. And over the next hundred years, those cities and factories got bigger. And then Henry Ford in 1908 created the automobile and he was the godfather of not just the automobile, 
but also the assembly line. And so we put everybody into these factories working on assembly lines and everybody could do the same job. Whether you were smarter or dumber, you could do the same job, just put your cog on the wheel. And so they came up with these management techniques and management styles to manage the masses through an industrial complex. And government then was shaped to manage or govern over those types of societies that had masses amount of people in a cog and a wheel, you were basically boiled down to a line in a spreadsheet. And so central planning in those mass scale, mass it made uh, sense. manufacturing yeah. businesses and a government that managed centrally managed on high made yeah. sense. We're not in the industrial age anymore. We're in the digital information age. We don't have big assembly lines anymore. And now people live all over the world with little tiny Tiny bits of information technology and the form of government we have today is old it's archaic it doesn't fit anymore it doesn't move it's not fast enough and so i think that is also the big battle that we're seeing the big thing is is uh governments always have to control the narrative so we have to control the information so this book the revolt of the public i was actually able to read this recently and it's a great book it talks about what he's saying about that the government is really not able to control the narrative anymore as far as what is happening. So if something will happen, government will say something, and all of a sudden, like, it's disproven. It's shown that it's not true. You see this even in the Arab Spring when, you know, stuff happened that, you know, was in Egypt or other areas where all of a sudden these dictators that can control everything can't control it anymore. So we're in a different place that it's yet to be seen what this is going to look like. And he's going to share more on that. And just like the printing press 500 years ago broke the church's ability to kind of control the narrative, right. um, the internet did the same thing today. Yeah. And so now, you know, CNN, it used to be actually Walter Cronkite. There's a great book on this. It's called The Revolt of the Public. Um, but like Walter Cronkite was the trusted news source. Yeah, Jay, check it out. I just did an interview with the author. It's going to come out. It's a great book. Highly recommend it. The Revolt of the Public. Fascinating. Yeah, I like that book. Yeah. yeah okay. Anyway, um, you know, Walter Cronkite was this trusted news source. Every night he would deliver the news, right? Um, but what happens is now with the internet, we can quickly debunk anything. Like no one is, no one's on high anymore. Like somebody says anything, like the New York Times just did this hit piece on this Bitcoin miner uh, in Texas. And like, instantly just debunked everything. Wait a minute, you used the wrong name. That's a fake photo. That's doctored. Look at all this information that's wrong. And they just got picked apart. And so there's no way to control the narrative when a million people can fact check you in real time. That's yeah. the battle. And so they, the pro, but, the, but then there's the paradox. So the paradox is a nation needs people to be educated and communicate freely. So there's creativity and there's ideas and progression. Someone's got to design the next rocket ship and the next AI. Yeah. So we need it. But the problem is if we have it, then they're constantly going to overthrow us. So we can take it away and be North Korea, <laughs> but then we're just North Korea. And so there's like that paradox. And so anyway, the, the form of government we have today, back to the point, is it's just not compatible anymore. One thing I love about Mark is that he just talks about it's important to kind of like light fires under the in the minds of men and just get people fired up. And if I'm taking action, if I'm sharing videos, I'm talking to people about this and I'm going to conferences, it can't help but change my life and change the lives of those around you. So share this with someone else. Uh, and I, I, I side with Jay. I'm super bullish on what happens when a million entrepreneurs are backs against the wall. Yeah, I'm, you know, just uh, just Google it. <laughs> that I, I make videos on YouTube. Just search Mark Moss on YouTube. You'll find him there. Uh, or your favorite podcast player. Just search Mark Moss on there as well. Um, and, you know, I like to talk about, uh, you know, freedom. Obviously, it all starts from there. So mostly financial topics, macro, geopolitical, trying to understand the flows of money, where they're going. Um, you know, Bitcoin, of course, obviously, some real estate as well. Uh, but just ways that you can secure your wealth and ultimately secure your freedom. I think those are the most important things. Um, I'm, I've been pounding the table, um, really trying to encourage, motivate, educate people to go on a little bit more of a... Um, let's say, uh, let's say more of like an op, uh, aggressive uh, kind of stance as opposed to just kind of like going and disappearing on a mountaintop, taking your Bitcoin or whatever, going to live on a ranch somewhere. And I think we need to be a little bit more on the offensive here. And so, um, you know, trying to, trying to encourage people, like I said, educate people, um, setting up. Uh, and, and when I say uh, aggressive, uh, I don't mean uh, going and storming the capital. I just, I think uh, through the economic means, through capitalism, I think is how we can change the world. Um, giving people the ability to, to vote with their money. I think entrepreneurs have been asleep at the wheel for too long. And so we really need to have entrepreneurs step up and allow consumers to vote with their money. And then we need consumers to back those businesses and vote with their money. Um, so if you like those topics and you'd like to learn more about those, then uh, yeah, give me a follow. Just check it out, Mark Moss on YouTube. I'm awesome, probably too, too active on Twitter. You can find me there, one Mark Moss as well. <laughs> 
So it's important that we bet on entrepreneurs, right? We've seen that over years that places that have entrepreneurs that are, are great uh, for business, places that are business friendly, which the U.S. has been. It's not as business friendly as it is now, but um, still there's going to be incredible opportunities. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you enjoyed it, please make a comment, hit the like button, subscribe to this channel. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, the full interview with the rest of the panel is down below in the link or on our YouTube channel, Bronson Hill. Uh, if you want to join our investment club, we're doing some really unique deals outside of traditional Wall Street. We're doing deals in multifamily apartments, oil and gas, ATM machines, and car washes, among other things. You can check it out in the link below or go to our website at bronsonequity.com. Thanks for taking the time to educate yourself. Look forward to seeing you on the next video.